How's everybody doing today? Welcome back to another episode of The Banker Next Door. I am your host, Dr. Joe Burquist. Uh, today, I'm uh, bringing on a very special guest, a very good friend of mine. Uh, Alan Berkeley is going to be coming on to join us here, and I'm going to bring him in. And what we're going to do today is this isn't necessarily an interview. Uh, we're just going to have a conversation about a number of uh, banking topics. I guess you could, you might call this my first attempt at a co-host uh, on the show, which I'm, I'm very excited about. But let's uh, let's bring Alan in here real quick. So, Alan, how how are you doing today? I am doing well. Couldn't be better. Great, excellent. I, I I thank you for for coming on and spending a little bit of time with us. And we're we're going to do something a little different today. This isn't like I said. This isn't really going to be an interview. This is more you know you and I just kind of talking shop, talking banking, and uh, we're going to go over. We got a number of topics here. We're going to try to run through. And um, but I guess I guess well I'll start here real quick for the just for the audience. Uh, do you want to maybe just Tell a little bit, of, just give us a minute, maybe a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. I do commercial banking. I'm on the CNI side for those not out in, not in banking. That's commercial and industrial. Uh, so essentially, I'm working with uh, Tompkins. Tompkins is an $8 billion bank out of Ithaca, New York, 60 locations across New York and Pennsylvania. And I work within the segments of CNI, you know, doing manufacturing, wholesale distribution, and the construction trades. You know, really anywhere, $100 million and under in uh, privately held businesses. Providing Perfect. them credit, cash management, and so forth. Excellent, excellent, and uh, and I will tell everybody that that Alan and I are both uh, graduates of the Stony Air Graduate right. School of Banking. Uh, if anybody just saw the the interview I did with Greg Smith, who is the curriculum director down there at Stony Air, go you know if you if you haven't had a chance, go go check that out. But uh, but Alan and I are both uh, Stony Air graduates. We didn't meet at Stony Air. We kind of met in our travels around the banking you know sector, as it were, around the, the local PA market. Uh, but Alan and I both, but we we crossed paths definitely while uh, Alan was going through the Stony Air program, and I was down there doing the whole Capstone Advisor gig and everything. But um, but yeah, so Alan and I have known each other for a long time, and I just thought that he would be a great guest to uh, to just come on and just kind of talk about you know just a lot of these different topics and things that are going on in the business right now. So there's a lot going on, Joe. Oh my gosh, it's like yeah, it's unbelievable, right? Um, uh, okay, so I guess you want to start with the big news of the minute. Uh, obviously, the the failure and then the subsequent sale of Republic Bank to Fulton Bank, another you know good sized local bank here at our PA market. Uh, so, what do you any any thoughts on that coming out of the gate? Obviously, that being the big news of the moment. Yeah, I, you know, ordinarily you would you don't like to see in market stuff happen. You know, just from a job loss standpoint. But I think overall, I, Fulton is it was one heck of a bank. They've got a great culture over there. They've got nice local leadership. Uh, so, you know, having said that, I couldn't, for those that will be remaining and choose to stay on from Republic, I think it's going to be a really nice place to work. They've got a lot of dry powder. They do a lot within the communities. Um, you know, so it's, you know, it's one thing to look at a bank from a, uh, you know, what's our, what's our earnings, our EPS and so forth. But you, if you look at banking from a, it's impacting the community you know, a community adjusted EBITDA, if you will. Uh, I think Fulton is is certainly top of the class or one of them up there uh, in, in doing that and making an impact in the community. So I think it's just going to be a good fit all the way around. It's always unfortunate when you see a bank fail, right? It's just yeah. something within our industry. We, we like to compete against each other. Uh, we certainly don't like to lose against each other. But at the same time, we don't like to see anyone uh, from a banking standpoint, banks, uh, you know, banks fail. And, you know, you and I had both gone through the uh, the, the great financial crisis and uh, where it was just, you know, seemingly for me it was, uh, you know, every every 12, 15 months, it was a new bank uh, because banks were, you know, kind of you know being just being gobbled up. Uh, so, you know, I I think that's from their standpoint, the Republic, I think it puts it gives a lot of certainty to the people that were there. Um, I can't imagine what it's been like working there for the last year, year and a half, um, you know, with, all, as, as you had mentioned in a, in a previous uh, episode, the, uh, the soap opera that was going on. Yes. So this, least, soap opera. this provides at least kind of a, you know, it, it provides clarity and hopefully it provides a nice path forward for, uh, for a lot of the folks over at Republic. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree totally. I mean, I, I've had a, a, the opportunity to meet a number of individuals from Fulton Bank over the year, over the years. Uh, their their ex CEO who just retired, uh, he was actually very involved with the Stony Year program for a long time. Um, Ed, great guy, and um, you know, so I, I just know they like. Yeah, I agree with you. Like, they have a very good culture over there, so I, I think they'll do a very good job of you know taking in uh, Republic Bank and and you know doing the best they can for their employees there in that in that situation. Um, 
Uh, but I will say, you know, a couple of interesting questions I've gotten, you know, the last couple of days, I think for people in the area was that the, the first one was, uh, you know, like, oh, is this going to be, uh, you know, kind of like the do like the first domino that's going to start, you know, a subsequent number of bank failures. And and my, my response to that was kind of like, no, yeah. uh, I, I like what I the way I answered that was I said, you know, this wasn't shocking for anybody here locally in the banking scene because uh, mm -hmm. everybody kind of knew that there was just a lot of stuff going on over there at Republican Bank. And they uh, they had a lot of, uh, you know, they had a lot of issues uh, you know, just all kinds of board infighting and yeah. just other things going on. But then they had other issues like they, you know, I think they did have a little bit of, of loan delinquency. They did have some uninsured deposits. They had some other, you know, some bond portfolio issues like this. So there was there was a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you know, kind of going on over there. But when you put it all together, it was just a bad it was a bad mix. And, uh, you know, so so again, I don't think anybody was surprised by what happened there. Um, but I, I also think that it was probably the best possible outcome because if the bank was going to fail, you know, the, the worst thing that could have happened was the bank failed. Nobody, nobody wanted to buy it. Like everybody was like, no, no, stay away. And then all the employees got instantly laid off. Yep. Um, no severance, no nothing. And from, it looked like from an article that I read yesterday, uh, they, um, it looks like the employees are at least guaranteed. Like they're going to be, I think they're, I think Fulton has said they're going to pay them for at least the next 90 days. Right. So that, so that's yeah. like, you know, that's at least something, you know I mean? That's better than, that's better than the alternative. So, right. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, all, yeah, I mean, all things considered, I, I think that this will end up the best for everybody. Um, it, like you said, to your point, it was, it's, it's always, um, you know, it's always messed up when you see somebody fail, especially if it's somebody in your local market where, right. you know, I mean, I, you, you, I'm sure you and I both knew, I right. still, they still know a lot of people that work there. So, yeah. uh, you know, so it's, uh, so it's, it's one of those things that just, it just kind of, yeah, it kind of stinks all the way around, but, um. But I think the more important thing was it is it no, you know, this is a singular incident. It's not going to be this isn't this isn't like kicking off a whole, you know, uh, another you know banking crisis or a bank catastrophe or anything like that. Um, they were a good sized bank. I mean, they were a six billion dollar yeah. bank, but there weren't like giant. I mean, they weren't like a, it's not like a hundred billion or one hundred fifty billion or whatever. So you know, and, and you know the thing is too, they actually had a lot of besides employees that remained. They had a lot of the you know depositors that remained. Mm -hmm. You know, so yep. I, I'm with you 100% that I don't think it's the the first of of many. This they they were simply isolated for just a number of reasons that were very very well publicized, and they were you know it was publicized for for a long period of time, right? It wasn't like a, almost like a SBB where it's it snuck up right underneath us, but yep. I you know but I you know I think too, even though SBB as you know as sad as that was last year. You know, it really did allow all of us banks to you know to go ahead and just kind of you know dial things back. Take a look at things just from that, you know, the basic safety and soundness principles and just, you know, really take a look at our balance sheets and our, you know, our growth strategies. Maybe we don't necessarily have to grow 15 percent a year. Maybe 5 percent growth is OK. Right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. just liquidity management and hedging on our side. You know, I need, you know even at Tompkins, you know, we had sold a lot of our, our longer term bonds uh, that were yielding under one percent. And we had rolled them into shorter duration yielding. I think they were plus five. So that's nice for us, you know. Yeah. So, but but you know, those are things. But for SBB doing that and and rates being where they're at, I don't think you know banks probably would have been like that. Just business as usual, and you know everyone's making money and everyone's doing well, and then you know the tide is rising, and um, you know it's Milton Freeman or not Milton Freeman, but it was Alan Greenspan was the one that said, uh, you know, the, the the worst decisions are made in the best of times. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> this at least allowed us to take a pause and just uh, to reevaluate things. So I think if anything, you know, we're from the banking standpoint, we're on better footing. Uh, it would be nice to see interest rates start to come down because that is certainly impacting, you know, our industry with net interest margin and some of our borrowers um, that, you know, especially on the on the CRE aspect of things. But but overall, I think banks have a pretty good grasp and have, uh, you know, put fences around their deposits, especially their good depositors and uh, have a pretty good grasp about what's in their portfolio. And, um, and I think that's being shared, you know, when they share their, uh, you know, they're, they're publicly, um, you know, they're all publicly traded, but they, you know, I read the transcripts of all the banks and I know that that's being shared with the, uh, you know, with the analysts and within the transcripts. So, yeah. And I, you know what, I think that is a perfect segue into our next topic here, which is interest rates. Uh, I'm actually looking at right now. So I've got, I've got CNBC up over here and I'm looking at, 
you know, basically the Fed has, you know, they, you know, Jeremy Powell has said that they're staying pat right now. They're not they're at least they didn't do anything today. Um, you know, let's see. Let's just I'm just I'm just kind of reading the headline for a second. So it says basically Fed keeps rates steady as it notes lack of further progress on inflation. Uh, Treasury yields fall as Fed says it will ease back on balance sheet tightening. So that's obviously a very good thing for the Treasury markets. Um, you know, because I believe the Fed was still um, reducing their they were trying to reduce their balance sheet by seventy five billion a month, something like that. Yeah. Um, so obviously, if they if they back off on that and stop the reduction of the balance sheet, that'll help the you know that'll that'll the treasuries the bond market will respond positively to that. Right. Um, but uh, but I mean I think I think the uh, the inflation and just the fact that the inflation is remaining very stubborn and not only is it stopped coming down, it's starting to inch back up again. Um, now, you know, that, that's obviously, you know, you know, that's, that's given them a, a big, a big pause at the moment. So, but yeah, I don't know. Any, any, uh, any thoughts on interest rates? I mean, you think they, do you think they will try to cut something later in the year? You know, um, I'm not sure about that. I, I don't, I think this year is, is almost a loss year. I don't think we'll see another hike. Um, I think you're right. I think just, you know, a, whether it's a pause or a deliberate slowing of quantitative tightening QT, uh, would be, you know, maybe similar to quasi uh, reduction, right? In terms of it'll it'll play out favorably for the you know for borrowers, uh, but I don't see them hiking another quarter point. By the same time, I really don't that they cut. It's certainly not going to be after the election. Um, I, I could easily see that being a 2025 event, um, you know, because the last thing they want to do is, and unfortunately, it's you know, and not to sound political, but that you know we don't have you know, fiscal policy really isn't aligned with central bank's policy right now. So it's, you know, continue to spend and, and keep, uh, you know, keep the numbers up and elevated and everything looks rosy. Uh, but at the same time, that's, that's certainly not helping inflation. And if, if the Fed is trying to tame inflation, uh, you know, they, they've, they've also have to, uh, you know, fight fiscal policy as well. So that is, oh, that, that is tough. Hey, anybody who's listened to this show knows that I have made no bones about calling out the the rampant fiscal spending and how the fiscal policy needs to get um, under control and needs to get back under control in a big way because you just the you know unless like like unless the Fed wants to hike rates to literally twelve percent fourteen percent like they're not going to be able to beat that defl uh, beat that inflation unless the fiscal policy the government size of the equation really gets serious about you know, reducing the spending and getting things uh, back under control, because I mean, they can, you know, the Fed, the Fed's in charge of the monetary side, they can only do with so much. I mean, it's not, you know, you yep. can't, uh, you know, we, we, we could pick on them, we can, we could give them a hard time, whatever, but you can't put 100% on them. Like the, the you know, the, the government has half the coin, they have half the coin. And then both of those, those two sides of the coin got to work together to, to fix the problem. And right now you got one is, is semi serious about it. And the other one could, basically care less. So it's a, so it's, it's kind of a, a messed up thing, but, uh, but I want to get back to what you said about, you know, not, you know, them not hiking the rates or are them not reducing the rates in, you know, b probably before the end of the year. And I, I actually agree with you on that. Um, I think that, you know, it was interesting, Alan, because I would say if I go back to like November, um, I would say, you know, a lot of clients were calling me up saying, oh, yeah, yeah, they're going to make we're going to have massive yeah. reductions to interest oh, yeah. rates and they're going to they're going to cut 300 basis points and all this stuff. You know, I've been watching CBC and Bloomberg. And they're all telling me they're going to cut rates. And, you know, and I looked at it and I, I said, no, I said, I honestly, I said, I don't see it. I, I don't see it. I said, what is the what's the rationale yeah, for it? I said, I said, they I said, they they haven't beaten inflation. Infl I said, inflation might be coming down, but they haven't beaten it. It's not, it's not beaten. And. And, and here, what do you really believe about the jobs report? What do you really believe about the GDP? Because if you're just looking at the headline numbers and you're looking at the headlines that are out there, you know, the GDP is doing fine. The, the job market is doing fine. So if that's if that's your basis, what's where's the rationale for reducing the rates? Like if, if everything right. is humming along, uh, you know, the whole purpose of, of the Fed hiking rates was to slow the economy to yes, drive us into recession, slow everything down, and then that would bring the inflation down. Um, if the economy is basically humming along and they're predicting like this soft landing and everything is basically going fine and the inflation is higher than they want, but but certainly not out of control, 
Where, where's right. the rationale? Where's the rationale to cut the rates? And I, I think that, and so, and it's just not, it's not there. And, you know, the, the Fed knows it's not there. Um, that's why Jeremy Powell's not doing anything. And so, but, and I, and I agree with you because I, I kind of sit here and I say, okay, we're, we're, it's May 1st. Um, you know, we're, you know, what's going to happen here in the next seven months, you know, eight mm-hmm. months, you know, like wh- where's, you know, unless um, I look at it like this, unless there is some kind of major catastrophe, you know, the the, the markets collapse, uh, the real estate sector collapses, like so, something major happens, then the Fed might, you know, they, then they might do a 180 and say, you know what, we've got to just, yeah, we got, we're going to have to drop the rates by three, 400 basis points right. to, to try to, to try to make something happen here. But I mean, outside of that, I, I don't I really don't see them reducing the rates. I, I just yeah, I just don't I, I don't I don't see what the what a rationale for it would be. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing. You know, first and foremost, I would love for a soft landing, but I don't think historically that's ever been achieved. So not, not that I know of. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's so I think really the only thing that's quite frankly going to tame because, you know, even if we do, you know, hike up rates to 14, 15 percent. Well, if we, you know, we match that with uh, fiscal policy that says, well, you know, it's tough for all the Americans to uh, to afford gas and groceries. So we're going to subsidize this. We're going to give you more money each month. Well, it's it's not helping. (laughs) So I I don't even I don't think so much uh, that the monetary policy is is really going to influence that so much as, you know, inflation coming down due to a recession. Unfortunately, I think that's the only thing that's really, truly going to work for the recession. A recession comes in, drives rates down, curbs spending. You know, the consumer, uh, I'm with you on the numbers. It's, it's funny you talk to businesses and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough for businesses out there. Um, but, you know, the, the government spending right now has propped up GDP. You wonder what that would look like, but for the government spending, uh, mm-hmm. what GDP would look like. Yep. You know, what I, what I do hope is that we haven't, you know, created, um, you know, rather than just, you know, pull off the Band-Aid quick and fast, you know, we've ended up just piling more and more money and it's, you know, it's, it's the, you know, the story of, you know, the drunk and he wakes up with a hangover. So <laughs> rather than just let it tell him, go back to bed and sleep it off. You say, well, here, here's a, here's some hair of the dog and just you keep going and you're in a cycle. It's not helping anything. So I wonder if this is making, you know, a, a recession that much more pronounced when it does happen and perhaps even longer, you know, if, even if you look at the recessions, you know, 2020 being a little bit of an anomaly, but if you do look at the recessions going back, you know, maybe the last 40 years, they have gotten deeper and longer in duration each time. So, and it's, be, you know, because of, in large part, because of the fiscal response of throwing money at it. Well, and, and you know, and we've also had this phenomenon uh, going back to the the kind of early to mid 90s with Alan Greenspan of the jobless recovery. You yeah. know, like we've seen these recessions that have come in and then you get a you know, you get a recovery, you get a recovery in terms of, you know, uh, company growth, the, you know, maybe, you know, revenues are growing or bottom line profits are growing. Um, and, you know, maybe the stock market's doing well going again, but, but their companies are not growing in terms of jobs. They're not hiring a lot right. of people. They're not adding. And, and even if they are hiring people, it's part-time work. It's not, you know, you're, it's not your, your good full-time jobs that are going to pay people a decent salary and that kind of thing. Um, so it, yeah, it, it is. I mean, you you do yeah. I mean, it does it does lead to a lot of questions there, a lot of a lot of thought. And I think, I, I think the issue for me though with the with the numbers and like I I look at it like this. I, I try to look at it from a very realistic standpoint. I look at it and I say I say to myself like this: every uh, every administration that has ever been has always manipulated the economic numbers to some extent. Because they because they because they always want to spin. They always every administration doesn't matter. Republicans, Democrats, doesn't matter. They want to put the best, you know, face they can on the economy and everything that's going on. So they're going to they're going to tweak some stuff here and there and say what they want to say and, and spin the narrative and all that kind of stuff. I just have never seen a situation like we're in now. Like, I mean, literally, it's like I look at the jobs report and when you break that down, it is completely the opposite of what the headline says. Like the headline will sit there and say, oh yeah, we, you know, we grew by 300,000 jobs last month and it was fantastic. But then when you really dig down to those numbers, you see like literally all the jobs were part-time jobs. The full-time jobs are actually decreasing. We're losing thousands of full-time jobs every month. Um, And you begin to get this picture that, you know, yeah, people are out there working, but some of the people are working two, three, maybe even four jobs 
to make ends meet or to get ahead. And then, and then I think the, the worst part is at the very end, you have uh, native born workers and foreign born workers, and all the jobs are going to foreign born workers. And that, I mean, that's just, I mean, and that's just kind of like mind boggling. You're just sitting there like, what, like, what, what is, what's going on? What is, what is happening with this? And so I think when you, when you start to peel that onion and you, and it goes back and, and it goes, and also to what you just said too, about the GDP numbers, like our, like we just had the GDP number came in, it came in at 1.6%, which is very, on on the surface is very anemic. But just to what you said, that was that was growth that was bought by the government with the government spending. If you took that spending out, we're at a negative GDP. So, you know, again, I think, you you know, you look at a lot of this this stuff. And once you kind of pop the hood and you look underneath, you're like you're like, wow, I thought I had a great engine and I opened it up and, and man, that engine's about to fall apart. You know, when you look underneath the hood and, and I think that's the, I think that's kind of the crazy thing here because I, you know, on the, what, like when you get, like when you get back to the fed and you get back to interest rates, you kind of sit there and you think about like, well, you know, they're making decisions based off of the headline numbers, but, or the headlines rather. And if you dig b- below the headlines, you see that, yeah, things aren't as anywhere near as good as what you would think. So there could be your justification for reducing rates. How, but then they'd have to admit exactly. that yeah. they'd have to admit that, yes. hey, this, the stuff we've been telling you for the last year, uh, <laughs> yeah, that that really wasn't true, you know. And yeah. of course, yeah, they, and they don't they don't want to do that. So then you have a credibility issue. So, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. They're never going to happen. They'll let the you know they'll let the White House continue. And again, no matter what president's in there, there's there is the narrative that they want to use the numbers to fit the narrative that they want to share. But, uh, you know, and and again, it's these these levers that they pull, you know, government spending, for instance, um, you know, and it's so it, it does. The headline looks better than it is. But you and I are in the field on a daily basis. And, you know, the businesses we talk to, no one is expanding. No, right? no one is saying, yeah, you know, we've got these large growth plans, Alan. Uh, that is not happening. It's we're sitting tight. Uh, we're expecting a recession. Uh, so we're just, you know, right now we're, we're doing as but to also tell you, we're Similar to what you said in terms of, um, you know, for instance, um, you know, more labor intensive folks that are maybe working two or three jobs. Business owners themselves are telling you that, you know, I'm working probably two times harder than I have for the same amount of pay and revenues that we're gaining before. So it's just been tough. It's tough. But again, you won't see that from the headline news, which is which is it does, you know, give me pause that, um, you know, that this ultimately could not end well. Right. It's you know, there's only so long that you could kind of prop up a story, right, and prop up a narrative, you know, before the you know the truth is is, is revealed. Yeah. Um, oh no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So like I said, I think I, I agree with you 100 percent there. I think that sooner or later we're gonna kind of hit a wall of a proverbial wall, so to speak. And yeah. and, and this, yeah, it's all gonna it all roll out at that point because because there'll be nothing left to hide. It'll be it'll be there for everyone to see. And it'll be okay, yeah, yeah here we here we are. Um and it does. Okay, I'll so, tell you what, Joe, on the, on the one thing about the interest rates while I've got you. Yeah. Because this, this stuff tells nicely. If you think, you know, we're thinking, we're, we just talked about short term, you know, maybe next six, 12 months. But you think long term, you know, you look at, you know, China has substantially slowed buying our UST, you know, and you look at debt to GDP levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you look at the central banks across the world and you think, you know, we, we have to start charging a higher premium for our, uh, for our treasuries. You wonder how that's going to play in. You, you wonder how ultimately blockchain technology is going to play in when there's, you know, less need or reliance on, you know, our our bond market to collateralize transactions. So I think long term, though, and you know, the guys at Chatham might uh, might disagree with both of us here, but uh, they do a great job. They you know they they help us as well. Uh, so I have nothing but uh, but love for uh, for the guys we, over. We at love Chatham. you. We love you, Bob. We love yeah. you, Bob. Nothing bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, see, so you, you wonder, uh, you know, long term, um, you know, and they, they they probably would agree, you know, from a swap standpoint, they certainly would. I think long term, uh, you know, rates are going to be substantially higher. Short term, yes, you know, it's an election year. There's likely a recession coming, but I think long term, if if you peel away everything and you say, hey, debt to GDP, which is only going to be exacerbated if there is a recession, you, you've lost a you know a lot of tax income. Right, and you're doling out a lot of benefits, right? So that number should only expand. 
Uh, you know, and then you look at the rest of the world, and I, I think globally, sadly, we're probably the cleanest shirt in the in the laundry, which yeah. that doesn't say much about the rest of the world. And in terms of a potential, you know, uh, you know, fiat debt crisis out there, you know, looming. Yeah, um, and and like I said, and I say is that yeah, and I do worry about you know the whole bricks situation and what's going on with that but mm -hmm. we'll but we'll have to save that for we're because we're 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 running we're running a little short on time here so we did have a bunch of other topics we wanted to get to but we we didn't we didn't think we'd get through everything today but we we were going to try to hit as much as we could so i'm uh, definitely hoping that that alan i'm hoping you'll definitely come back and and we'll continue sure. this conversation because we got a lot more we got some regulatory issues we got central bank digital currency we got kind of the the bank m a market uh, reduction in bank branches. Like we got, we got a lot of other topics and things that we can, we can kind of jaw on and go over. But, uh, but before we wrap up here, I just wanted to ask you, so do you, do you have any, you have any good uh, business books or anything uh, recently that maybe you read or, or would like to, to drop a line on? Sure. I, I, I read quite a bit, uh, although I have a rather nerdy, like for instance, right now I'm reading a book on algorithms, which is for, you know, for, <laughs> for programming, as you know, uh, I would tell people, you know, I, I finished up uh, prior to that, Redeeming Your Time, which was a great book, but uh, the all-time classic, I'm still the Stephen Covey guy, so The oh. Seven Habits. And, of course, as, as Philadelphia Eagles fans, you know, we've got Britt Covey, so you hope his grandson, you know, it's it didn't – oh, that, that knowledge didn't fall far, fall too far from the tree, but uh, Seven Habits is, is always the, the all-time go-to, uh, the refresher class, if you will. Um, you know, if you're ever going to reread a book multiple times, seven habits for sure. No, yeah. I, no, I love it. It's one of, one of my all time favorites, man. I, I love, you know, um, I would also tell anybody if you, if you've never watched, uh, a Stephen Covey video, YouTube's got a probably, I mean, dozens, if not maybe even hundreds of, of videos, both long and short on, yeah. on Stephen Covey talking about the seven habits and everything. And he, he is an, an incredible uh, per, you know, public speaker. Like oh, he yeah. is just, he, I mean, he is just, he's got a great voice. Yeah. He's got, he had a voice. He actually had a voice for radio. Like he could have been like, he could have yes. been a voice. He could have been a voiceover guy. That's how good his voice was. But he, um, you know, yeah. So he's great. Like, I, I mean, he's one of those guys, like you could just sit there and he's, he's almost mesmerizing. Like you could sit there and just listen to him for three hours and feel like you were sitting there for five minutes. Like he was just, yeah. he was that, he was that good uh, of a, of a public speaker. So, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I, excellent excellent suggestion alan and i i would highly suggest anybody go and read the book you know get the audio book go check out some of his youtube videos but yeah it's it's absolutely worth reading it's an it's an all-time classic so yeah, absolutely but uh okay anyway well to to wrap up alan i thank you so much for for coming on today and hanging out i definitely hope you'll you'll come back again but absolutely. if anybody uh if anybody wants to contact you what would be the best way for them to do that uh, phone is as best. I give you my personal cell, which is 484-844-9450. And then from an email standpoint, it's uh, a Berkeley at Tompkins com. Perfect. Fantastic. So, and again, thank you so much, Alan. And uh, like I said, I hope, I hope to, we'll get you back here again real soon. Love it. All right. See, see you later. All right, everyone. Well, that was Alan Berkeley uh, joining us today for our little conversation on kind of everything going on in the, in the banking world right now. And definitely hope to have Alan back on here, but hopefully maybe in a, maybe in a couple of weeks, maybe we won't uh, wait that long to get Alan back on here so we can continue talking about some of these other topics. But uh, if you like the video today, please make sure to like, share and subscribe. That always helps the channel. Uh, please make sure to leave any comments down below. I always love uh, getting everybody's feedback and then, you know, try to try to respond to everybody as quick and as efficiently as I can. And also always remember uh, we are on YouTube rumble and all major podcast platforms. You can come check us out and uh, please make sure to check out some of the other episodes. I'll be, be posting a few more this weekend and uh, be uh, hope to see everybody back again real soon. So thanks a lot.